I'd like to thank the American Friends of Bar Ilan University for uh, sponsoring this event. And friends, what I'd like to do uh, today is to share with you a feast of visual images that you will be able to bring to your Seder table and uh, uh, add hopefully insight and inspiration uh, to our celebration of, Pes of Pesach. Uh, to give a sense of what I have in mind, let me throw out the following observation. We all recall from the Seder, from the Haggadah, that Hashem took us out of Mitzrayim, out of Egypt, with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. And that phrase, Yad Chazakah mighty hand and outstretched arm, you would think that any time in the Tanakh that God does something great, a miracle perhaps, that the, that the Tanakh would say, and Hashem did that with his mighty hand and his outstretched arm. But the fact of the matter is, is that we find this phrase almost exclusively with reference to the events of the Exodus and nowhere else. And it's not an accident. When we look in the inscriptions of ancient Egypt from the period called the Egyptian New Kingdom, 1500 to 1200 BCE, probably the zenith, the highest period of, of, uh, of all of Egyptian history, which happens to also coincide with the period of the enslavement of B'nai Israel in Mitzrayim, in Egypt, we find that there are descriptions of the pharaohs all over the place that routinely will say that the pharaoh did this, that, or the other with his mighty hand or his outstretched arm. The pharaoh defeated the Libyans with his mighty hand. The pharaoh bagged 120 elephants with his outstretched arm, and on and on. Now, why would the Torah take the language of the pharaohs and use that to describe the events of Yitzhak Mitzrayim, the Exodus. And the answer is, friends, is that what we see here is an exercise in what we call cultural appropriation. It's where you steal, it's where an oppressed people will steal the thunder of their oppressors and reuse, repurpose those statements, that propaganda for competitive ideological purpose. And that's exactly what we see have going on here. That the Torah will say, you think that the pharaohs are great? Well, watch this. We are going to defeat the pharaohs, not only on the battlefield or at the, or at the Red Sea, but also rhetorically. And we are going to steal their thunder. We are going to out pharaoh the pharaohs. We are going to say the mighty hand and the outstretched arm, that doesn't belong to the pharaoh. That belongs to the king of kings. Now, this is one small example of how we can have suddenly new light and insight on passages in the Torah, on passages that we read on Seder night that come from the ancient context of understanding uh, uh, a little bit about Egyptian civilization. Now, some people say, and uh, I need to kind of make sense of this for, for everyone out at the front. Some people say, wait a minute, what you're saying, Rabbi, is that there are parts of the Torah that were more evident, more clear to the first generation of Jews that came out of Egypt than all subsequent ones. Because after all, the insight that I've just shared with you has been buried by the sands of time for millennia. And maybe the first two or three generations coming out of Egypt, maybe they still understood what mighty hand and outstretched arm referred to, the royal, the royal propaganda of the pharaohs. And we today, my colleagues that came across this some 30 years ago, uh, have shared, now shared it with us. But what about all of B'nai Israel in, in between. So isn't the Torah eternal? And if it's eternal, how can it use idiom and expression that are from a very specific period, the period of the Exodus? So the answer, my friend, is that what I'm, my friends, is that what I'm doing here is really not my own approach. It is actually the approach of Maimonides, the Rambam. The Rambam routinely does this in the third section of the Guide to the Perplexed. He will lay out what he sees to be the purposes of various mitzvot, and he will often, especially with regard to the tabernacle, the temple, uh, the cultic sacrifices, he will say, the reason that the Torah tells us to do this, this ritual in this way or the other is because this was actually the way that it was done in pagan settings way back when, and the Torah is taking it and adapting it, tweaking it a little bit, making it a little less physical, obviously more monotheistic, less idols, et cetera, et cetera. And what the Rambam says is this was absolutely necessary because B'nai Yisrael were on a certain level and Hashem knows that he can only, that all development, human development, 
national development, cell development only happens in a very gradual process. And so we had to start from where they were from. And I'm sure that the Rambam believed that the Torah was eternal and that it had eternal ideas. And I suspect that what the Rambam would say about this, this approach uh, of, of seeing the Torah in ancient context is that the Torah has many facets to it. It had shivim panim, 70 facets. Many of these are eternal and the lessons that are as, as true and obvious and, and relevant for all ages, no matter when a person is reading the Torah. And then there are other facets, other faces, if you will, that come out at certain times. Some were more relevant for the generation of Yitzhak Mitzrayim. Others, let's say the Kabbalah came out and got greater expression and greater understanding and development later times in Jewish history. And so the eternal nature of the Torah does not disallow us to find certain extra layers of meaning. Some of those one or two facets of the 70 facets uh, by looking at the ancient context of the Torah. And that's what I wanna share with you here today. So let's get to our, to our images, okay? I'm gonna open up here my PowerPoint presentation and share it with you. Okay, now let's see if we can get the, the slide going. Let's see, okay, slideshow. And, and we're gonna start from the beginning. Okay. Well, the rabbis told us that on Seder night, that when we're sitting around the Seder table, a person has to see themselves as if they came out of Egypt. And what better way to do that than actually reimagining and discovering things about ancient Egypt and what B'nai Israel might have been seeing and thinking when they were there. I want to start with a, 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 a pasuk, a verse from the end of Sefer Ba'ikra. Hashem says there, referring to the Exodus, I, I broke the, uh, the, the poles of, your, of your, the yoke and I led you out upright. Now the yoke here, the yoke, the yoke of subjugation, this is, this is a metaphor that's found everywhere in the ancient world. Uh, political subjugation is a yoke. Uh, now a yoke, as we, we know from paintings and from archeology, span yokes on animals at that time had one bar that would go across the back of the animal one bar. But this pasuk says that Hashem broke the poles, not one pole, the poles of your oak, your yoke. What does it mean, the poles of your yoke? A yoke has only a single pole. Well, let me take you into the funeral, funerary chapel of a vizier by the name of Rechmire, who was a higher up a big important guy for a pharaoh who lived during this Egyptian new kingdom that I mentioned before, that overlaps with the period of the enslavement of Egypt. Now, in a little chapel devoted for, to his memory, so obviously what's on the walls, all of his accomplishments, all of the, the, the that he oversaw of water and the slaves would take out the water and they would mix the clay uh, together here and they would uh, put them into um, uh, uh, frames to make them of, of, a, of a certain size and then they would pile up the bricks and then we have this here let me blow this up here you can see here then we have people lifting up the bricks you see this this fellow bending down he's got a crossbar that goes over there's two piles of bricks, one here and one here. And then he has to straighten up as this fellow has done. And he's got that pole going across his back with bricks hanging down here and bricks hanging down here. These friends are the poles of your yoke. And when Hashem says, I will destroy the poles of your yoke. That is referring to this. Okay, now look here also, we see that we have uh, this fellow. I'm just gonna move my, my little image here. That's less important now. Uh, this fellow and this fellow, this fellow is carrying bricks on his head. And this of course is a taskmaster. You can see that he's got the rod here. And apparently if we go back to the previous one, we can see that he would probably the, uh, 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 the slaves with their piles and walk along with them. And this suggests that this suggests that that 
as slaves would be carrying the bricks, they would have a taskmaster who would escort them. And that tells us a lot about the verse, that when, the, when Hashem says, motot uchem, and I destroyed, I smashed the poles of your yoke, chem, and I do come In other words, as opposed to the taskmaster who, who accompany you in oppression, I accompany you and you go direct, right? Now standing up because you don't have to strain like this fellow does here, you can now be erect, okay? I'll say also that, that when we look back at this whole register of the depiction of mud brick making, we see something a little bit surprising. Let's kind of draw an imaginary line down the middle. What you'll notice is that everything on the left is about brick making, the water, the mixing, the setting into uh, frames, the piling them up. But half of the work here, from, from here to the right, is not about brick making, but about brick schlepping, schlepping, schlepping along, schlepping, schlepping until you get to the final, the final destination. And we can see echoes of this, that a lot of the work involved in the brick making industry was the schlepping of bricks, not the making of bricks. Uh, in Shmot Perik Hay, when Moshe and Aaron approach Paro for the first time, and they, they ask to, be, to go out for a, 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 a service of God, and Paro says, you should go to your burdens, your burdens, your carrying burdens. And that's really what we see here. I'll say also that you can see here in the inscription above this fellow, do you see this right here? You can see some faintly some hieroglyphs here. What this says is it's kind of, it's, it, it, in, in our terms, it would be like in a comic strip, a bubble, a bubble of what this guy says. You can imagine a little bubble here. It says, I hold, let's go back. I hold the rod. Do not be idle. Do not be idle. I find that so fascinating. He doesn't say faster or, or keep going, but in a negative, what you shouldn't be. Do not be idle. And this is exactly also what we see in Shmot Perakei, when Paro says in different ways on a couple of different occasions, near Pimatem, near Pimatem, you are trying to be idle and that's why you want to go out for your uh, uh to, to have a as it were a holiday for god okay so we've seen here how uh this depiction of uh bricks can really shed light on that 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 pasuk at the end of Vayikra about the poles and it really animates many of the things that we have in the story of brick making in shmot perik hey okay let's move on to something else okay here we are. I want you to look at this fellow, okay? You can see a boat. This is a boat, a kind of a very flat boat that was very typical of how they would uh, traverse the Nile back in the day. And you can also see that his arm is clearly extended and that he is pointing to something. You see the pointing finger there, okay? Let me show you this photograph as I, as I took it when I visited this. Uh, this is also a funerary chapel near the pyramids. So this is the fellow we were looking at, and he's got his straightened out arm, and he's pointing. And this guy behind him, also on the boat, he's also is pointing. But what's not clear, friends, is what are these men pointing at? Um, one second. Uh, they don't seem to be pointing anything in, in specific. Here, this is kind of like the water line. This is the surface of the water. And here are fishies. That's very nice. There are fish. They don't seem to be pointing, ooh, there's fish. They're just pointing kind of at the water, kind of randomly. What's that about? Well, let's look at another image, kind of similar. This is the line drawing from somewhere else. And we have the same thing here. Here are some men. They're in a little skiff, a little boat on the surface of the Nile, and they're pointing. See, outstretched arm and finger pointed, outstretched arm and finger pointed. But what are they, it's not clear exactly, other than it's in the general downward direction. Well, it turns out, friends, that what's going on here is that when people would cross the Nile, uh, this was a dangerous uh, uh, venture. These boats are very, very small. They're even maybe flatter than canoes, maybe almost kayak size. 
And what everyone is mortally afraid of is this. What we have here in the water, the crocodile, the crocodile. Even before they see the crocodile, they are afraid of the crocodile because the Nile at the time is infested with crocodiles. And if the crocodile, you can see, he's almost the size of the boat, one good whoop from the, the tail of the crocodile, and these guys are lunch, as would these guys be, as what he would be. So now what do you do? What do you do if you're the Nile? What you want to do is you want to cast a spell on the water. And that's what's going on here. These guys, they're, they're all trying to cast a spell on the water to keep, to keep crocodiles away. In fact, this guy, the, the inscription says, he says, why aren't you saying the spell? Help us put a spell on the water that will keep the, the crocodiles away from us as we cross. And that's why they're not really pointing at anything in particular. It's not, oh, look down there, there's a fish, there's a crocodile. They're just pointing at the water because somewhere in the water there's gonna be crocodiles. And so we have to cast a spell. And apparently a spell is cast with the, by throwing a finger, pointing a finger at something and saying the right hocus pocus, that will cast the spell. Now, friends, I share this with you because this really animates uh, uh, something that we see uh, in the plagues, in the Eser Hamakot, and that we even talk about in the Haggadah. And that is this. In most places, when Hashem acts, it's called Yad Hashem, the hand of God. Uh, in Makat Dever, it refers to uh, uh, the Makah as, as Yad Hashem, the hand of God. But we find one place where the plagues, or a particular plague, is referred to as the finger of God. And this is in the third plague, gnats. And what happens there is that the, the Khartoumim, the magicians who say, oh, this, this plague, this is the finger of God. It's the only place where we have a great act of God referred to as the finger of God. And what's that about? It's because there, it's not the Torah speaking, it is the Egyptian magicians who are speaking. And so when they speak about, wow, this, we've never seen anything like this. This is an amazing miracle. This, uh, there's some, some, someone has gotten control of nature here. Someone has cast a spell. It must be the etzba elokim, the finger of God. Okay? All right. Okay. Take a good look at this picture, friends. What do we have here? Well, we have a pharaoh. And we have his right hand is raised. He's got a mace high up in his hand. And his left hand is holding the hair of prisoners of war, and he is about to shatter their skulls. Now, which pharaoh is this? And the answer, friends, is that this could be any pharaoh, not just because we don't know, we probably do, I don't remember which one, but every pharaoh was painted in a scene exactly like this. This was the iconic image of the pharaohs for 3,000 years. If you want to think in terms that might be more familiar to you, think about uh, if you've visited a museum and you've seen paintings of kings from, let's say, the 17th or 18th century, and you'll have your kind of classic picture. The king is on a horse, and the horse, his hoofs rise up, and the king looks out, selfie, paint me, right? I mean, we've all seen paintings like that. Every king posed for something like that. In fact, I suspect there were kings that were afraid of horses, and they still said, paint me like that. That's what it meant to be a king. You get your portrait, you know, up on the horse with the hoofs up. Well, this is what the pharaohs did. So this was an iconic image that anybody in Egypt would have seen and recognized as that. Now, what's so interesting is that this, I believe, is the, the, the source or uh, the reference that the Torah is using in Shirat Hayam, in the Song of the Sea, when we say the Pasuk, and we say it every morning in our Tefillah, Yemincha Hashem, your right hand, Tir Atz Oyev, shatters the enemy. It's again, it's that, that, that issue of cultural appropriation. It's not the Pharaoh's right hand that's smashing the enemies. No, after Kriyat Yamsuf, after the drowning of the Egyptians in the Red Sea, we say that it is your right hand that shatters the enemy. Okay. Move on to something else. Ah, this is one of my favorites. Now, see if you can see carefully what's going on here. Well, you can see that we have two figures. 
And they're in a pretty intimate pose here, you know? Here's, he's got his hand around her midsection, or we'll, see, we'll talk about the gender in a minute. This figure has a hand over the shoulder, like behind the neck and over the shoulder. Uh-huh, here's another picture like that. See these two together, right? Again, the hand drawing close here. Uh, obviously, this is very intimate. Uh, this figure is drawing the head of this person over to here. What's going on here? Wow, who knew that Egyptians could, uh, you know, put on such scenes? Well, first, the first thing I have to tell you is that both of these scenes, both of the figures are male. Yes, I know this looks a little fem uh, feminine, but this is a pharaoh's headdress. And we know that it's a pharaoh because you can see kind of right here, that's the Uraeus serpent. It's a little serpent that shoots out fire, according to their mythology. Uh, King's, King Tut's mask has this on top. All the pharaohs are wearing this. Happens to be in just the place where we put our tefillin. And I wonder if that's by accident or not. Hmm. You know, they have their sign of their god here. We have our sign of our god here, maybe. And, and by all events, this is, where's my pointer? Pointer, here we go. This is a pharaoh. And this is the god Amun, you can tell by this headdress, okay? And what's going on here is that the pharaoh and the god are real close. And here too, this is the pharaoh. Same thing, right? The Uraeus symbol, the pharaonic headdress. This is the god Ptah, a male figure. And they're really intimate. What's going on? And the answer is, is that what these images, and they're all over the place, is trying to demonstrate is that the god, the, the pharaohs, They, they're real close. I, mean, I, I find these, first, I just think they're really fascinating images, but I think also that they might help us understand some things in the Torah. You know, the Torah says uh, about, uh, about Moshe, when Miriam uh, said Lashon Hara, slander about Moshe in the book of, of Bamidbar, Hashem uh, uh, rebukes Miriam and says to her, you know, you should be careful about what you say about Moshe because pe el pe, I speak to Moshe mouth to mouth. And I never understood that, that phrase, to speak to somebody mouth to mouth. I mean, mouth to mouth might be for intimate things. Mouth to mouth might be for um, resuscitation. But I, don't, I would never think of myself as speaking to anybody mouth to mouth, maybe mouth to ear. But you can see that these figures here are mouth to mouth. They are, they're not, they're drawn that way deliberately. It was true here too. Do you see that? It's, 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 it's absolutely by design. And I think that what the Torah is trying to say is, Miriam, Moshe is as tight with me as you used to see the pharaohs and the gods together. He is as intimate to, with me as a god as any human can be. And this would have been in a way that, that, that Miriam would have understood. It might also help us, this, these, these two images, friends, whoops these images might help us also understand something that the Torah tells us about the revelation at Sinai, Ma'amad Har Sinai in Sefer Dvarim. There, Hashem says, Panim bepanim diber Hashem Face to face, God spoke to you at Sinai. And I never understood that phrase because we have in many places in the Tanakh, we claim that man cannot see God. Lo yirani ha'adam b'chai. So how could it be if we are not able to see God what was Hashem trying to say at Har Sinai when he said, well, at Sinai, at the giving of, at, at, at the establishment of the covenant, ah, there, God, there, face to face, he spoke with you. And I think that perhaps what the Torah is trying to say is that this tight bond between gods and men, which in Egypt was available only to the pharaohs, in the Torah, it's now available to all of Klal Yisrael. All of Klal Yisrael is elevated to the level of a king. Okay. All right. The last thing I want to share with you. Something about, well, it's something about the Mishkan. And also, I would say something about that demonstrates what we've, what we've shown until here, friends, is that the Torah is, is aware, intimately aware, of ancient Egyptian culture. Generally, different facets, different images, different phrases. But I want to show you now a question that many ask. Well, is there evidence for
for the Exodus itself from the Torah. And I want to share with you something that I think is evocative visually and helps us understand the Mishkan, the tabernacle, and also is part of why, why I think that there is ample evidence for the Exodus in the Torah. Let me just start by saying that you may have heard, and it happens to be true, the claims of many scholars that we don't find evidence of what the Torah says anywhere in Egyptian sources. Um, this is pretty true. That is to say, when you open Egyptian sources, you don't find Moses, Aaron, slaves leaving, plagues, Israelites, Hebrews, nada, nothing. Okay? However, however, um, there might be reasons why that is. The Egyptians tended not to write bad news. They never lose a battle. Uh, all the things that are in the area that B'nai Israel resided in, Eretz Goshen, i.e. today, the northeastern part of the Nile Delta, kind of near the Suez Canal, uh, on the west bank of the Suez Canal, um, is now either underwater or there's absolutely nothing left. Virtually no, no mention of Egyptians either. So that might be part of the explanation. But I think that more significantly for our purposes is that we have to realize that scholars need to work in the other direction as well. What do I mean by that? That means we start by reading our Egyptian inscriptions and then we need to turn to the Torah and say, what does the Torah know about those Egyptian inscriptions? And that's when things get real interesting, friends. Before you is a map. Yes, you knew that. We have here a map of Egypt in the south and Egypt's reach. This is, um, this is during the, the new kingdom that I spoke of before, 1200 to 1500 BCE. Uh, the reach of Egypt went far. That is, it went from Egypt up through Eretz Canaan, up into Lebanon and modern day Syria, halfway up Syria. At the time in the 13th century BCE, this is the reign of in the region during the time. So we have Egypt extending its uh, hegemony up through here. And his arch rivals are the Hittite Empire in Turkey. And they extend their hegemony down until this meeting point, which is pretty much along the modern day border of Syria and Lebanon. And they have it out, the big battle, the Battle of Kadesh. 1274 BCE. Scholars think that it might have been the largest chariot battle in all of history. Now, who won this battle? Well, it depends who you ask. The Egyptians say they won. And the Hittites aren't quite as emphatic about it, but they don't seem to suggest that they lost either. This is how ancient history works. Everybody thinks they won. Now, what's important to me is not who won or who lost, or really what happened up there on the Lebanese-Syrian border in 1274 BCE. What is important to me is what happens when Ramses turns around from that battle and goes back home. Because when he goes back home, he makes the Battle of Kadesh the most publicized event in all of ancient history. What do I mean by that? Think, for example, of something we're all familiar with, friends. The Arch of Titus in Rome. Titus sacks Jerusalem in 70 CE and builds an arch, one arch, one arch of Titus. One event, one arch, one memorial. Not Ramses, Ramses comes back and we know of at least 10 different places where he put up inscriptions and base reliefs of this battle of Kadesh so that everybody would know about it. And these are only the places that have survived that we know about. It. In fact, in some of these, some we also have Papyrus versions. This is from a workman's camp. You know, when people came back from building monuments, pyramids of the like, in the 13th century BCE under the reign of Ramses, they were hearing this story of his escapade, his escapades at the Battle of Kadesh. Now, I mentioned to you that in addition to actual textual accounts of what happened there, there are also base reliefs. And I want to talk about what we see in these pictures. Okay. This is at one site. This is at the, uh, uh, the, 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 the Luxor Temple uh, in Luxor. And this is the military camp of Ramses. You can see it has a wall that goes around it. If you can follow my cursor, these are kind of shields that they made here. They made a wall of shields that goes all the way around. In the center of the camp is the king's throne tent. And it also has a wall of its own that goes around. And then the tent itself has two chambers, a larger one and a smaller one. The larger one has proportions two to one. 
and the smaller one has proportions of one to one. You see exactly the same thing at another location. This is the military camp at Kadesh. This, is, uh, this has a wall going around the camp up here. In the center of the camp, the king's throne tent, two chambers, one chamber that's two by one, one chamber that is one by one. And here's a third site, the same deal. We have the wall going around the entire camp. And in the center of the camp, we have the king's, we have a, a wall again, an inner wall. And within it, the king's throne tent, two chambers, two by one and one by one, okay? Now, why do I mention all this? Well, what scholars started to notice in the 1930s is that what I've pointed out here points to a, a remarkable similarity uh, uh, between and a resemblance between the Mishkan and the throne tent of Ramses II at the Battle of Kadesh. In both, we have a large uh, uh, a wall that goes all the way, or we have a, a wall that goes around the, where the throne tent is, just like we have here. We have entrance to the compound from the east. Notice, friends, in Egyptian maps, the east is on the left. Things seem upside down, but then again, the Nile flows backwards. It flows north. Maybe that has something to do with it. Um, and then we have the, what's in the center. So as we said, in the center of uh, Ramsey's military camp is his throne tent, which has two chambers, an outer one, the reception tent, two by one, and then the actual chamber of the Pharaoh itself, one by one. And this is what we have in the Mishkan. You have the Kodesh, kind of the outer chamber, and then you have the inner chamber, the Kodesh, Kodeshim. I want to just look this, or this, the, from, this, from this image here, I'm doing a, a blow up now of what you see right here. What you see, this is the outer chamber and you have, I don't know, servants or somebody bowing down. And this is actually Ramsey's inner chamber. What do you have here? You can't draw a little tiny Pharaoh. That's as we say in Yiddish, pasnish. That's like the meaning to the Pharaoh. So what they do here is that they, they draw what's called a cartouche a little symbol that has his name in it. But look what he is surrounded by. Do you see this figure here? This is a falcon with its wings. And here too is also another falcon with wings. They are, they are shielding the cartouche, the little sign or symbol of Ramsey's name. This is so similar to what we see inside the Mishkan that we have inside the Kodesh Kodeshim, the place where the Shechina dwells. And it dwells between the Kruvim whose hands, whose arms are going out. This is a universal symbol in the ancient Near East of protective wings, but it's still pretty, pretty evocative and pretty remarkable how similar these are. Now, what's the idea here? Well, this is our, our final example, friends, of what we have been referring to as cultural appropriation. What scholars say is that what the Torah is doing, that it's stating, well, the camp of Israel is also a military camp, as we know from Sefer Bamidbar. And what the Torah is trying to do is it's trying to concretize for B'nai Yisrael just how great the Ribbon Shalom is, the Almighty, the King of Kings, having overthrown the greatest king of the greatest period in Egypt and using the, 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 the propaganda, the base release of his greatest achievement, the Battle of Kadesh, the Torah comes along and flips all that on its head and says, this King of Kings, who you cannot see, who you cannot hear, but you will be able to relate to him if you think about the greatest signs and symbols of kingship now transferred over to the Ribbon of Shalolam. Okay. Um, in my, in my, uh, 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 I have a book, I think it might've been mentioned in, in, in the introduction. Uh, um, the book is called, oh, here, just let me say that we have here, this is the actual, uh, 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 drawing itself, illustration on, in other words, what we had here, this is this. And you can see here, we have the Mishkan, we have two by one, those are these guys who are, who are uh, bowing down. And here you can see clearly the two falcons, the gods Horus with their wings extended over the name Ramses, okay? Um, this is an insight that I have inside my book, Anima Amin, Biblical Criticism, Historical Truth, and the 13 Principles of Faith, uh, which has many insights of the type we have been seeing here today. 
uh, if you want to see some more. Let me just finish by saying that I, I sometimes uh, uh, people ask, okay, okay, this is all very compelling, uh, the similarity, but Rabbi, how do you know that it was the Torah who was taking from Ramses? Maybe it was Ramses who took from the Torah, huh? Huh? Some people don't like when I say that the Torah is taking from Ramses, okay? And I just want to end with why I think that is the way to go, okay? And do a little experiment. The bombs bursting in air. Did you understand what I just said? The bombs bursting in air. I'll tell you what. If you are, if you did understand what I just said, I know something about you. You are American. And if you didn't understand what I was doing when I say the bombs bursting in air, I know you are not an American. Why do I raise that, friends? When someone is speaking, when someone is writing, and they invoke another composition, as I just did, the national anthem of the United States, which has the phrase in it, the bombs bursting in air, if I am doing that, I better be sure that I'm speaking to a group of Americans. Because if I'm speaking to Brits or if I'm speaking to Europeans, they're not going to understand what I mean if I use that phrase, ah, yes, it's like the bombs bursting in air. Put differently, friends, when we invoke another work, another composition, we only will do so if we're certain that the audience gets it. If they don't get it, what's the point? It falls uh, flat. Okay? And that's why I say that it's the Torah that is taking the design of the Mishkan, one aspect of the Mishkan, to help us understand the kingship of the Rebona Shalom as being a replacement for who they thought was the greatest king. Because all the slaves in Egypt saw all this stuff over and over, place after place. They were reading it when they were coming home from work. Everybody knew this. And so when the Torah does this, then people get it. But it doesn't work the other way. See that there were some, there were some Egyptian soldiers that survived Kriyat Yamsuf, the splitting of the sea. And they went to Israel. And they were able to read Hebrew. And they read about the Mishkan. Let's say, let's say, let's say, okay? Then they run home and they say, oh, let us make depictions of Ramsey's greatest event, just like what the Torah said. Who would get it? The bombs bursting in air. None of the Egyptians would get it. And this, friends, is why I think that uh, 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 we should have no compunction in saying the Torah engages in cultural appropriation. It outfarrows the Pharaoh. It steals their thunder. And when we do that, then we will be able to say, on Seder night, Chayav Adam, Re'ot Atzmo, Ki'idu Yatsama Mitzrayim. That with the lessons we've seen here, hopefully on Seder night, we will be able to say that we too came out from Egypt. We have tried to understand what it was like to be there and what it was like to come out. Best wishes for all of us here at bar -Ilan University, the American friends of bar, -Bar -Ilan University, for a Chag Kasher Vesameach.